Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, a, a case of an individual who we, uh, an individual who we looked after, and of course who became uh, of great interest because of chronic infection. And um, at the time, new variant we were studying this individual. And, you know, variants were not even described really um, in the in the way that we know them now. So it's kind of hard to imagine those days. Um, but what we realized is that what we were studying is 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 in my view how how new variants emerge uh, and 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 we I think it's certainly it's due, due to chronic infections, as I'll uh, explain uh, during the talk. So uh, just to just to start here is here's uh, my lab and uh, really uh, um, the work that you're going to see is a result of a huge uh, sort of amount of effort from individuals uh, um, uh, over um, uh, extended periods and uh, and so I have to acknowledge them uh, up front so uh, we wouldn't be. Uh, having this talk without their, their hard work and endeavors. So uh, so chronic infection uh, or, or long-term shedding was recognized as an entity in SARS-CoV-2 infection um, some, somewhere around the middle of last year. Uh, we had our first wave in April and we, we'd we noticed that some people were um, having um, uh, shedding virus for prolonged periods. We didn't really know much in, in, in the way of sequence what was going on, but certainly uh, uh, CT values um, sometimes were, were usually quite high. In other words, the virulence were low, and so this was just seen as a tail end of an infection. Um, then there started, we started seeing uh, uh, case reports of uh, long-term infection in immune-compromised hosts towards the end of, uh, uh, towards the middle and end of the year. So, so for example, there was a paper in Cell by Evan Zato et al. There was also Jonathan Lee's case in the New England Journal. Um, so there were, there were these two reports that, came, that sort of cropped up whilst we were studying um, the, 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 the case that I'm going to describe. Um, and the, the, the sort of key features that we were hearing about, certainly from one of the cases, the asymptomatic case, was the, um, a number of deletions occurring in the NTD. Um, uh, and in the Boston case as well, uh, NTD deletions, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, emergence of mutations in the, um, the spike protein uh, RBD. So, um, and then as, as more and more of these cases emerged, we could see that the that, that, uh, variants of concern um, had many features in, 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 in common with, with those viruses. So uh, I'm going to just start by, um, you've probably seen lots of slides in this symposium. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on, 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 on the sort of biology of the virus getting in, but I think there are, there may be a number of people who, are, who, who, who haven't um, sort of delved into this um, uh, very much, but we, it's, a, it's quite a complex process um, that in, uh, of, of entry of the virus into target cells that involves obviously the spike protein that has these two subunits, S1 and S2, and um, uh, they need to be uh, uh, cleaved in order to uh, form an infectious um, uh, uh, virus that can, that can enter efficiently. And um, you can see in this diagram that, the, um, that, the, uh, the, 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 that once cleavage has happened, uh, uh, that the the uh, fusion peptide can then insert into the target membrane and cause membrane fusion, and if you zoom in here to the um, to the interaction site between ACE2 here in gold and uh, the spike receptor binding motif in blue, you can see the number of different contacts that are made, and what I've highlighted here is the number of the mutations that we see in some of the new variants, um, N501, 417, and 484. You can see they form intimate contacts with um, with the with ACE2, but also they are uh, known antibody targets. We know that uh, mutating these residues does confer escape to various monoclonals and also polyclonal sera to some degree. So we've um, got a, an intriguing um, situation here where some of our, some of our most potent antibodies um, and the most commonly produced antibodies between individuals are targeting the, uh, the, the RBM, the RBD, um, but also this is a critical site for interactions. So that's that sets up an interplay of selective forces that I think is fascinating to 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 investigate. So um, just to give you a just to zoom out here and, and say that, that I'm going to talk about a case, but really what we really want to understand is how you, we have um, come to the point where these variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2 really have um, scared everybody and threaten. Uh, have threatened control efforts um, uh, and and normalization of society and economies. So uh, you've got here the the, the 501 YV1, V2, and V3. Um, there will be more to come, but the, these are the ones that people are focusing on right now. 
and uh, it highlighted in, in red are the, the major mutations that are seen. And you can see that the, the, they all share 501, of course. Um, uh, two of them have four, E484K, um, uh, which uh, knocks out um, uh, a significant proportion of our antibody response. Um, and of course, you have uh, NTD mutations, uh, such as Delta 6970 here, Y144 in the UK variant, uh, and um, uh, 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 further mutations in, in that region in, in the South African and Brazilian uh, variants. So uh, the, uh, the, the other important thing to bear in mind here is that there are a number of mutations for which we, we have very little idea in terms of function. There are a number of mutations in S2. Um, uh, of course, the cleavage uh, uh, site at 681 is mutated in the UK, the UK variant. Um, uh, and there are mutations near the cleavage sites, uh, such as 701 in the South African variant. So um, the cleavage area may be uh, an area that the virus has mutated in order to enhance its infectiousness. So uh, th these mutations likely represent a combination of immune escape and infectivity enhancers. Uh, and certainly, again, the case will highlight some of this, some of these principles. So uh, we were um, involved in in the care of an individual who um, had follicular lymphoma and had been treated with uh, chemotherapy uh, some years back uh, um, following the initial diagnosis, which was more than 10 years ago. So he'd had 10, a decade of, of, of being diagnosed with this lymphoma. It was in remission for much of the time. Um, but in the last 12 months, there'd been a relapse and he'd been treated with rituximab, which is a, an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody that uh, that causes quite, quite um, marked immune suppression, not just of the B cell, um, compartment, but it also has an effect on T cells because, of course, of uh, crosstalk between the two arms. Um, and he'd had a, an a infusion of rituximab just before he was um, uh, first admitted with COVID nineteen to a, uh, to his local hospital. This was back in back in May, um, and he was tested positive in the middle of May for the first time, and and wasn't particularly unwell. Didn't require oxygen and was discharged. But then represented to hospital, um, to our hospital here in Cambridge, uh, a month later, with breathlessness and cough and uh, lymphopenia, uh, uh, a month later, and and at that point he was still um, uh, PCR positive. You can see the CT values down here in the graph below. CT value at the second admission was um, was was about twenty five, uh, so, which is a fairly high viral load. And remember, these are um, nose throat swabs uh, that that we take. Uh, that are put into viral transport media and, and undergo RT-PCR. Uh, he pr progressed in terms of the breathlessness and required oxygen and CPAP. Um, this was done in the intensive care unit, um, um, but he did um, uh, uh, he, his oxygenation improved, uh, but then suffered um, side of um, some other complications such as pulmonary embolism, uh, and then was stably unwell, let's say, uh, on the general medical ward in an isolation room. Uh, uh, over the next month, during which time uh, he was he was still persistently positive for SARS-CoV-2, and the decision was made, given that he was immune suppressed, his um, uh, antibodies were negative uh, for SARS-CoV-2 um, IgG. Uh, so we decided to give him remdesivir and um, uh, uh, some uh, and steroids, uh, which he received. This didn't really have much of an effect, and his, he was received a second ten-day course of remdesivir in July again, with little effect on the CT values. But at that point, uh, he was, uh, during the second course of remdesivir, he was also given convalescent plasma, two units as um, per protocol. Uh, this is given a day apart, and each infused bag is from a different donor um, of a recovered patient. Um, we didn't, we, we, uh, we saw um, a, an increase in CT value. So, so there was a trend, potential trend for, for, for reduction in viral load, uh, but this didn't last. Um, uh, uh, and in August, of course, you can see the CT values falling, uh, falling again. In other words, the viral load um, increasing. Uh, this coincided with progression of disease. Um, uh, the, you know, we then had problems such as acute renal failure, atrial fibrillation, because this gentleman was in, was in his 70s. And um, uh, the, he unfortunately progressed uh, and ended up in ITU um, and was given a further course of steroids, um, convalescent plasma, as well as toclizumab um, because of the severe um, uh, inflammatory response that we, we were observing uh, in the context of high viral loads. But unfortunately, later in, in the month, he, he passed away. So um, he'd had three courses of remdesivir, uh, three units of convalescent plasma and toclizumab, probably a little bit too late. And this was again before we knew that toclizumab was, was potentially effective. 
uh, and it could potentially have been given earlier, but we didn't really know the trial results at that stage. So um, going to the to the um, to the to the to the SARS-CoV-2 sequencing, we um, obtained uh, uh, 23 respiratory samples spanning 100 days. Uh, so that's an average of one every five uh, one every five days or so. Um, this uh, underwent uh, Oxford Nanopore long read single molecule sequencing, uh, which is what we do here in the UK. Um, uh, uh, although we also use um, uh, Illumina in some centres, so here in Cambridge we, we use Nanopore. Uh, we generated uh, this, this circularized phylogenetic tree for convenience, so you can see in black a background sequences from the UK. And we've highlighted in green the index case. Um, uh, you can see fairly some substantial diversification there of the virus. Importantly, this tree shows you that uh, it's unlikely that there was a, um, uh, a super infection event or a, or a mixed infection or even a contamination with other sequences. We do um, have quite high sequencing density here in the UK. And so um, the, uh, this enables us to, to, to confidently say that a patient who has shown significant evolution in their virus has not just been super infected by somebody else uh, because you would expect other, other individuals to cluster with this with, with the patient. I've also colored in uh, um, blue, red and purple here, uh, other um, patients from our center who had shed for at least four weeks. And you can see there that there's not particularly much sequence change there. Um, uh, of course, this is four weeks versus um, uh, um, you know, uh, four months. So of course, there's a there's a time difference, but those are the closest um, that we could get in our center to other cases of, of of chronic infection. So you can see that there's much more limited diversity in those compared to our individual. So um, looking at the whole genome, um, uh, uh, using this is now Illumina data because we went back to all of those sequences. Which were done for diagnostic purposes. We then resequenced uh, those amplicons using uh, Illumina, and um, then then um, here we've plotted the variant frequencies for everything above um, uh, uh, two percent uh, that was detected over uh, more than one time point. So here you can see over the first eighty-two days, um, uh, well, in fact, over the first um, first month or so to day thirty-four. Um, very little was happening in terms of uh, a change in the virus um, uh, genetic makeup. And this is kind of what we expect to see, really. I mean, if you saw chronic infection, um, this, is, uh, this, is, this was uh, entirely um, within our expectations. Um, during, the, during remdesivir treatment, we did see um, uh, viral populations uh, changing, uh, but uh, nothing came up above 50%, so it didn't reach consensus level. So again, by consensus sequencing, you would have seen no change uh, during that course of remdesivir, those two courses of remdesivir. Interestingly, this, uh, this uh, pink, uh, um, I think, the, sorry, this the, 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 the green triangle here, this is actually N501Y. So we did see N501Y emerge to around 30-odd uh, percent, but very, very interestingly, it disappeared. Um, and we can speculate on, on, on why that may have happened later on. So uh, here we, um, as, as, as time goes on, we, we, hear, we ha here have the two units of convalescent plasma given uh, around the day 60 mark. And uh, at this stage, um, uh, you can see uh, that uh, there is a quite significant change in that uh, you see these two mutations, D796H and 6970 emerge. So these two, um, these two um, variants, we might call them, start, um, start increasing in, in prevalence. We didn't have any sequences between day, the, the CP and day 82. So we don't really know exactly what was happening during this window. We've joined the dots, but, but really it's unclear what was happening there. I, must, I should also add that um, uh, um, between the, uh, after the, the, the second course of remdesivir, we did see a, a change in population uh, with this, mute, uh, with this um, uh, uh, NSP12B mutation, which is the RDLP. V157L mutation, which could potentially have been related to, uh, um, to, to escape from remdesivir, um, uh, but we've not been able to test that or validate it, and it's not been described before in the literature. But the, the, it is intriguing that we got a, a, a double mutant come up uh, around that time point, which then faded away, uh, presumably as the remdesivir wash, was, was washed out. And this time, with the convalescent plasma being administered around uh, day 65 here, uh, we then see this, uh, the emergence of this, um, this uh, double mutant in spike mm -hmm. that, we dis that I, I just mentioned. And moving forward in time here, um, 
uh, from day 82 to 101. You can see now this graph is looking really um, uh, quite dramatic. Um, we observed, uh, um, as I said earlier, D this is D796H and the Delta 6970 mutant uh, double mutation in spike. Uh, we, we saw these decline in um, prevalence to, to very, very low levels um, uh, by day 86. And this coincides with something like two weeks after, uh, so, so this is something like 20 days after the convalescent plasma was administered, and that's coincident with it washing away from the blood. You know, you, you don't detect it usually after uh, three weeks of administration. So this, um, this decline in that double mutant coincides with the, the loss of antibodies in the patient uh, from the plasma. Of course, he had very little of it. He was hypogamma globulinemic. In other words, he had uh, very, virtually none of his own antibodies detectable in blood. And that's the situation to which you returned. And coincident with that uh, that time point, we got a, a new, uh, um, we didn't just get wild type coming back, we actually got a, a, another double mutant, uh, so Y200H and 240I. Uh, this population of viruses uh, emerged for some reason, um, uh, persisted for, for some days, and then uh, we observed um, a, a decline in that population. Uh, towards day 93. And by day 93, we had an, a third um, population of uh, viruses uh, as defined by, uh, again, two mutations in the spike. One was P330S and the other one is not labeled here, but it's um, it's W64G. Uh, and uh, uh, and th that population then declined, um, coincident with the third bag of convalescent plasma, which was given uh, something, uh, something um, uh, like day 96. So at this point, he received a third uh, infusion of convalescent plasma. And remarkably, what we saw here is that the, 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 the viruses with D796H and 6970 deletion uh, re-emerged uh, during this um, plasma therapy. And then, of course, um, unfortunately, the, the patient passed away here. But you can see that a, a lot of other underlying uh, uh, genetic change was occurring in, in the virus population at this time. But we were quite um, surprised to see this double mutant 796H and 6970 coming back with the third um, uh, um, infusion of plasma, which you must you should remember that it was from a completely different donor. So it's three different in, uh, donors um, uh, 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 worth of uh, plasma administered during this course. This is a highlighter plot just showing you uh, uh, what happened over time in a different way, just um, we have a consensus based on time, time point one here, and you can see that very little sequence change going on here again for the first uh, for the first 60 odd days here with only a few changes. Remember, this is at consensus level, so that's why we're not seeing much. Um, then, of course, after day 66, when the convalescent plasma was administered, you get we start seeing change in, in the virus populations um, and the, the number of changes accumulates over time at, at consensus level. The black line here is the uh, Delta 6970 mutation. So um, this um, this tree is um, looking at uh, um, uh, spike sequences um, in particular. Uh, labeled by day. So here you can see the relationship between the different uh, viral populations bearing particular signature um, spike sequences um, and the time points at which they arose. You can see here in the first, um, in the early days of the, uh, of the infection, there wasn't much sequence change going on as we've, we've seen earlier. Um, sorry. But then um, as time goes on, uh, uh, you start to, you see, first of all, the, the, the Del 6970 population, um, uh, uh, the 200, 240 population, and, and as I mentioned earlier, the 330, 64 population. And please note the long uh, branch length here, um, which, um, which was very intriguing. We, this, this virus would, had not really been um, observed early on in the infection, it was uh, quite distinct from the other viruses in, in, in the individual. And when we looked at um, pairwise sequences comparing uh, the, uh, the, the, the P330 lineage um, as compared to the, um, the, the rest of the, uh, the sequences in the patient, we can see there is um, uh, that, they're, that, they're, that, they're, that they are distinct of, in terms of distance. Uh, and looking at this um, uh, in, a, in a different way, the, 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 again, this is the, the number of pairs of sequences that had this long distance associated with them. So the, we get the impression there are two independent populations here um, uh, in the individual, and this may represent a, a, an unsampled reservoir, a part of the lung where replication was somehow compartmentalized from the rest of the patient. Um, but for some reason, that virus managed to emerge in the nose and throat swabs uh, from day 90 and beyond for a limited period. This is a... a, a 
representation of some of those mutations again uh, mutation prevalence on the y-axis and uh, you can see each of these colors represents different spike mutations the dotted line is the uh, um, uh, the CT value um, and again just to, just to, for clarity showing you the different treatments here on the x-axis and the temporal relationship between the emergence here of the, the 796 and 6970 uh, green uh, light and dark green um, uh, um, populations here which then fade uh, uh, coincident with the plasma fading and then re-emerging during the last and final um, convalescent plasma treatment with the two independent populations coming up in between. So uh, what about these mutations? We focused on the, the, the 796 and the 6970 because this is the, this, these were the mutants that came uh, uh, were contemporaneous with the, uh, the, 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 the um, convalescent plasma treatment. So we assumed or postulated that these were um, uh, escape mutations. Uh, the Delta 6970 um, is, a, is, a, is a loss of two amino acids, H69 and V70, out on a loop in the uh, N-terminal domain here, as you can see. Um, and the D796H is also in an exposed loop, um, uh, uh, this time in S2, uh, uh, shown, shown in the blue box here. So, so quite um, uh, geographically distinct, um, but both what they have in common is that they are in exposed um, uh, loop-like structures. That may suggest that they could be antibody binding targets, for example. So we set out to test whether these were immune escape mutations and uh, uh, by using a, a single round um, uh, lentiviral-based uh, pseudotyping assay uh, that we had adapted from the work we do on drug resistance and HIV. Uh, this, uh, here we co-transfect a, a spike bearing uh, uh, protein in PCDNA3 um, along with uh, HIV gag pole and a luciferase reporter. Um, uh, so we transfect and then harvest virus, uh, pseudovirus two days later, and then we, um, uh, we mix the virus, uh, the virus is produced with uh, dilutions of the serum from the, from the convalescent plasma in order to understand whether the convalescent plasma is able to neutralize um, uh, uh, spike variants uh, and wild type or not. So we calculate um, ID50s and inhibitory dilutions required to, uh, to, to inhibit 50% of, uh, of the virus. Sorry. So here's a, here's a sort of schematic of the sort of pseudovirus that we produce. It, uh, has spike on the outside, but inside it has um, it, the genome it's carrying is 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 uh, is lentiviral and it's encoding luciferase, um, and it has gag uh, caps uh, HIV capsid um, uh, within the particle. So uh, this Western just shows you that uh, um, uh, um, uh, that we are, are able to express different spikes in the protein wild type, the 796H, the delta 6970, and then the combined mutant, um, and that uh, it's associated with HIV um, p24. We, we um, measured infectivity by, uh, uh, we had to normalize um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the luciferase readings for uh, the amount of R uh, reverse transcriptase activity in those, uh, in those lentiviral particles. Well, um, it's and, a two minute warning, okay? Yep, thank you. And then when we did this, we find that the 796 gives you an infectivity defect um, that's rescued by the addition of the 6970 here on the, on the end here. So. I mean, you can see that there's an impression that, you're, that the 6970 alone is giving you a slight increase in infectivity. So um, these, these figures just show you the, the, uh, the, the, the titration curves um, for the four viruses. And you can see uh, 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 that there's a shift of the uh, 796H uh, mutant as well as the double mutant, but there doesn't seem to be a shift for the 6970. Again, we tested the, the, um, uh, the this quantification of, of each of those. You can see in each case, the 796H is less susceptible uh, compared to wild type, uh, as is the double mutant. Um, this, this, this is, um, these are um, serum, uh, serum samples from the individual taken at day 64 and 66, and again show the same pattern. And this is consistent with the infused um, plasma in, in the patient. Uh, we tested a panel of monoclonals um, and uh, uh, directed against the RBD. Uh, very little change in any of these monoclonals. Uh, this is a non-RBD binding monoclonal that did show a difference where, with our mutants, um, but unfortunately we don't know where, where this where this monoclonal binds. It's hard to know exactly what uh, what the specificity is. But we can say from this figure that actually um, the mutations were not in the RBD, and therefore um, we're not surprised that these RBD binders had no effect. Um, 
So I thought I'd uh, talk to you a little bit about 6970. We can see that it's present in B117 in this um, phylogenetic tree. Uh, 6970 is also emerged in these red um, uh, uh, lineages uh, um, uh, in multiple different parts of the world. So it's a, it's a, it's a mutation of importance. I've already shown you earlier that this 6970 gives you a small in infectivity increase. And we think that this is associated with increased amounts of S2 in the supernatants, as well as in the, um, in the cell lysates. So somehow the, uh, the deletion is facilitating S2 um, uh, cleavage. Uh, and uh, this we think is related to its infectivity. We've also then reverted the 6970 in the B117. Um, and you find that you'd go from uh, wild type levels of infectivity and you have a quite a significant drop in infectivity when you repair that deletion. Um, and this also corresponds with a loss of S2. So this is quite intriguing, suggesting that the B117 requires 6970 for optimal infectivity. And, in, and this figure shows you that cell fusion is also um, enhanced in the B117. But if you remove the, if you repair the, the Delta 6970, you again um, reduce fusion back to wild type levels. So, so, so the 6970 is important for the B117. So in summary, we've shown the, we think what, uh, what we think is the first real-time documentation of virus escape from antibody. The evidence is uh, genetic as well as phenotypic. Um, uh, we think that the 796 probably um, confers broad escape. Uh, uh, we know that the 6970 uh, appears to be uh, rising in multiple lineages around the world, and it's probably a compensatory mutation for um, immune escape mutations. And really, uh, interestingly, uh, recently, the 1.147 has been uh, um, uh, identified, and this virus um, has the same mutations as in our patients. So uh, this is playing out in real life. This, pa this uh, lineage is not related to our individual, on the other hand. So we, we conclude that chronic infection is a likely source of new variants and can foretell key mutations that could be, should be put on surveillance lists in the future. And I'd just like to end by acknowledging the, the, the people on this slide uh, and the funders. And I'd like to take some questions if possible. Thank you very much, Robbie. That's a um, profound um, talk on a, quite a frightening problem. If I could lead off with a couple of questions while um, folks are, are gathering their thoughts. And again, I remind everyone, please raise your hand and I'll call on you in the order that your hand um, pops up. Um, can you comment just very quickly on what you think the main evolutionary pressure is within these patients for the virus to evolve? Is it the patient's sort of whatever immune response they may be able to, to harness versus the treatment of the patients? Um, can you comment on that? And the second question is what, what is the best way to protect these folks? Um, do they have to be isolated further? I sort of assume that they're not going to respond well if, if vaccinated. Yes, I mean, this is uh, the, 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 the key question. And the problem is that immune suppression is such a broad term and uh, it's hard to, with the current knowledge that we have, we're not really able to classify immune suppression in terms of risk of new variants um, or, or multiple mutated viruses. Uh, we, I mean, the case reports suggest that, you know, even people with asymptomatic infection who are chronically shedding can have, you know, significant deletions in the virus over time. Um, uh, it, I haven't seen any data to correlate the number of mutations with the degree of T cell or B cell suppression. So it, again, it's hard. But we do think that, you know, profound immune suppression of both B and T cell arms combined with administration of a semipotent cocktail of antibodies like CP is potentially a driver for, for, for immune escape in the context of somebody with a relatively high viral load. So, so I think severe immune suppression is a, is a, is a problem if you're going to use uh, monoclonals because I'm not sure that monoclonals reach, have the tissue penetration or the potency to, to combat an established infection that's in multiple compartments. So, but moving away from profound immune suppression, I'm not really sure what the balance is. And I'm sure that individuals will vary in the immune responses they make and what the virus does in response. And in terms of protecting the patients, is there anything that's being done or should be being done to these with these folks? I mean, I well, hate I to think, say, but do, they, yeah. do, do they need to be further isolated than we already are? I mean, yeah, it, in the US, you have isolation rooms pretty much for all patients. And but in the UK, we have a lot of open bays. But you know, anyone with immune suppression here now really should be treated in, in an isolation room, we think, especially if they're going to receive any um, form of uh, immune therapy um, because of the risk of, of transmission of, of, of variants. And I think that that's quite a real risk. 
uh, in terms of what we can do for the patients, because clinically, I mean, obviously new, 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 new drugs, prevention is the best thing. So of course, stopping infections happening in the first place uh, through vaccinating the rest of the population uh, and other measures. Um, but once you're infected, you're in a, it, it's a difficult position and we, and I'm, you know, regularly getting calls about what to do with, um, in terms of therapies for various people. We, we're, we're using combinations of monoclonals uh, where possible. Um, and CPs being used less and less, I would say. Okay, I think Rodney had his hand up next, so I'm gonna let Rodney talk. Um, you should be able to talk, Rodney, and then Steve has a question as well. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, really interesting talk, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask a simple question about the convalescent plasma and whether you actually were able to sequence the virus from the people who gave the convalescent plasma. And I know you said a lot about different lineages, but just the, the curiosity of whether those people had uh, also had that kind of variant or not. Um, yeah, thank you for, for your question. Uh, the, 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 the plasma was from donors who were infected during our first wave. So almost certainly had um, what we would call Wuhan plus or minus D614G. Um, it's very unlikely they had any other sort of mutations, but we don't, we don't really know is the answer. Um, uh, these are do donors who volunteer after they've been uh, diagnosed with COVID-19. So uh, usually by then it's not possible to know what kind of virus they were infected with. Fortunately, it was from an era or, you know, when, when, we, we, when there weren't many different variants around and it was mainly D614G or, what, or D614D. Thank you. Steve, why don't you go ahead and... Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to ask about the mutations outside Spike, whether any of those were, for example, drug-resistant mutants in, you know, maybe the remdesivir treatment. Mm. And, and I also, and beyond that, I wondered if any were possibly knowable as T-cell uh, targets. Mm. Yeah, those are, those are really important questions. We, we, to be honest, for, the, for that work, we focused primarily on spike because of the therapy um, involving monoclonals. But that E157, that 157, that V157 mutation in um, NS, um, uh, NSP12B, uh, you know, uh, could potentially be a, a remdesivir resistance mutation. Um, we haven't been able to test that in vitro. Um, I'm sure others will. Um, so, so yes, I, I would suggest that that was a response given that it's in the RDRP, I would, given that I would, I would postulate that as a, a, an escape mutation for remdesivir um, in the context of someone with really higher levels of virus replication. Um, and then in terms of other parts of the genome, there's, we're, we're only just starting to look into sort of the other changes that were happening uh, to try and disentangle what's going on. Yeah, whether those are just enhancement mutations or whether they're escapes um, would be- Yeah, so T cells, right, right, T cells. So we did have T cells from the patient. We have not done an HLA type, um, uh, although we knew that the, 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 the individual had severe, he had quite profound T cell dysfunction. So when you stimulated his T cells in vitro, they didn't do very much. And so it's unlikely in my mind that, uh, and because we didn't give any T cell therapies, it's unlikely in my mind that his T cell response exerted any meaningful pressure on this virus. Okay. 